Hi, Amanda. Hi, David. So we've just had a little introductory chat, but uh, you wrote to me a week ago because there'd been a spontaneous realisation uh, while you were watching a podcast, uh, Conscious TV. Mm -hmm. So um, you've got an amazing story, which I'd like you to share. And uh, it's, uh, it's just uh, off the scale, really. But um, <laughs> I'm sure you can tell it better than anyone. <laughs> oh, dear. Yes. So I, um, you want me to start from when I was young? Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. OK. So born in Birmingham, UK, um, my parents told me before, obviously, before I was born, my dad used to say to my mum, oh, please give me a daughter, please give me a daughter. Because um, I had an older brother. My mum had a child when she met my dad. And um, five years they tried and then I came along and I was born on my granddad's birthday. Mm -hmm. So growing up, being that, that, that wanted child, the love was, it was phenomenal. I loved my grandparents, loved my parents. I just loved life. Um, and I always, I always love to dance. I, my aunt once told me that I, before I could walk and talk, I was dancing in the cot whenever music came on. Mm. And I think that's probably because dad was a musician. He now, he used to play the guitar and he played the drums and he now plays the steel drums. So oh. I used to travel. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit noisy when he's practicing from home, but it's, 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 <laughs> it is nice to hear. So um, yeah, growing up, going to mainstream school, um, having lots of friends, but I remember when I was, I, I'm going to say I was five, I, I think I was younger though, mm. and it was a hot day, a um, bit like today, the sun was out and I could see dust particles, and I'm looking at the dust particles, and there was a, a big blue, I think they're called blue bottles, those big, yes. big flowers and it was buzzing around and it landed on my hand and I was looking at it and I was looking at the colours of the wing and how vibrant and I was just staring at this fly mm. and it flew away and I kept staring at my hand and I remember looking down thinking how did I get here mm. and touching my skin and really examining it and mm. and and sort of saying well I know who my mum and dad is but they never mm. they didn't create this they, they I'm not this body mm. and I think that was my very very first realization um I also remember a time when I was little and again I don't remember how old I was but we had this lady and um, we I say we me and my friend we used to relate to her as one of the wicked witches from the, the story tales because she looked like one she had <laughs> She had hairs on her chin and she just, she just looked like a, one of the witches from Snow, Snow White or one of those stories. And she used to chase us um, mm. when we used to pick flowers and the flowers were not in her garden. Mm. It was just like on some, some grass on, on a playing field, yeah. but it was close to her house and she used to tell us to leave her flowers alone. And so it's like not do a run where you're going to get chased. You keep going back. Yes. And I remember this lady, so a lot, a lot of children were scared of her because she was always chasing us. Mm. And one day, again, I know I was only little, um, she came out and she had extremely poor personal hygiene, mm. really bad. And again, this was in the summer and she had a kettle. And um, for, for, for people that were around in the late 60s and the early 70s, we never had electric kettles then. We had no. this the ones that you put on the, they used to whistle, you put the them ones on the stove. stove. Yeah. Yeah. And this kettle had all black marks on it and mm. like oil and, and her nails were really long and they were brown and she was standing with this kettle and all my friends screamed and they ran. And I just found myself walking towards, I wanted to run with the others, but mm. my body just went forward. Mm. And she was asking for somebody to heat, to get, to heat her kettle. I think she'd probably run out of electric. Yeah. And I took the kettle off and all my friends were going, oh, my God, you've got a dirty kettle and teasing me. But it didn't, it didn't, it genuinely didn't bother me. And I remember taking the kettle home and I, I remember knocking my parents' door. And I'd stood by the door and my mum noticed the kettle and she went mad, get that filthy kettle out of my house. <laughs> and I, I allowed my mum to show. I didn't, I, I just, I wasn't annoyed. There was no, no annoyance. And I just said, the old lady over the road needs some water. 
and she needs to have a cup of tea. Mm. And my mum continued to shout. And my dad, he's, he stopped my mum in her tracks and he said, you shouldn't tell a child off if they're doing something good for somebody. And my dad took the kettle off me, put the water in, and of course he put it on the stove and I stood there. And then my dad carried the kettle back because I, like I said, I was only a young child and I held his hand and we gave the lady the kettle. And my mum, she has forgotten many things, but that one incident, she remembers it as if it was yesterday and so mm. do my dad. And mm. that's, and I do, I remember it when I was just telling, talking to you about it, it was as if it's just happened. Yes. That to me was, it was very spontaneous and very intuitive. And I think when, when that happens with love, people remember it. It's just remembered. Yeah. Me, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, there was quite a few things growing up. Um, I say quite a few things. A lot. I had a dream when I was, I, I think I was about 16. I don't know how it started. I don't know how the dream started, but I found myself standing with an immaculate being. And I was just convinced that it was Jesus. Nobody told me I wasn't religious, wasn't part of religion. And this immaculate being I remember feeling joy. I remember being so happy and there was a beautiful, the sand was golden, the sea was blue and we were just, it was just me and him. Mm -hmm. And he spoke and when he spoke, it came out as a foreign language, but I, I knew what he was saying. Mm -hmm. I understood him. Yes. And I then spoke and that same language came out of my mouth, but I knew what I was saying. But whatever was said, when I woke up for about three days, I just felt this intense joy. I was just so happy so so happy um and I asked a few people I would tell people I had this dream and and you know different religions I'd asked and all of them said oh no it can't be God because nobody's ever seen God but I I didn't I suppose I wasn't looking for the answer I was just sharing my experience and seeing sure. if anybody else had, had had that experience um so growing up I I became a dancer and that was a spontaneous thing. I went to a dance studio to meet a friend, ended up getting a job mm -hmm. um, to teach dancing. And um, fortunately for me, um, some world champions that had done disco dancing had joined that dance studio. One of them trained me and I became a professional dance teacher within, I think it was two years. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a dance teacher. I also had day jobs, so I worked in shops and then I worked in a betting shop. And I then took on a job in a, bet, uh, in a, in a post office. Yes. And of course that's cash handling, mm. but I never once lost it after that money. I didn't once no. think, oh, I want this money. It was a job and I was honoring the job. And one day I sat down, David, and, and I, I said this to you in our first talk. I don't know where it came from. But I sat there and I said, I want to be a millionaire. Just like that. I want to be a millionaire. <laughs> um, and very quickly, I was approached by somebody to do a post office scam. Mm. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I can. But then I sat, the words had gone in and I was pondering. Um, and I was plotting how, what step I was going to take, how I was going to do it, mm. how, how it was all going to look. And I found myself doing it. I mean, I'm... I'm chuckling now but my god um it, it's it how i done it I, I i genuinely don't know but i know i had guilt the first time i done it and mm. i i just bought lots of presents for people it was like okay i'm never going to do that again i'm not doing mm. that again but it carried on i didn't have any addictions um i didn't really have any reason to do it i, I suppose mm. greed it was it was solely greed and it was I suppose it was that that fantasy that I wonder what I'd do with a million pounds. And I ended up buying a lot of things for other people that was um, mm. deprived. I, I oh, remember yeah. going, yeah, I remember going to my parents' bedroom and taking their rent book. And back then it was poll tax, it wasn't council yes. tax, poll yeah. tax book. And I took um, their telephone bill and I remember taking it without them knowing. And I paid something like two years up. And then I put mm. them back so they didn't have any problem, any worries with bills. Mm. And I, I and I don't know if I was attracting vulnerable children that had holes in their shoes. And mm. so I would just look, take a mental picture. I, I don't know how I done it. 
I would know what age they were, what size shoe. I genuinely don't know how that was done. Mm. And I would go and I would just go to Marks and Spencer's or to Laura Ashley. I'm giving it all away now where I went. <laughs> I, would, I would buy them clothes and just, and just leave them on the doorstep and disappear. Mm. Um, this went on for six months. And um, even how we got arrested, the police didn't initially link me to mm. the crime. They didn't have no knowledge of me. Mm. Um, but then when, when all the figures were added up, it was 1.3 million. So I did become a millionaire, but I didn't keep all the money. You did some visualization there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so consequently, I'm gonna go to prison. I didn't think of that. I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna go to prison. So my solicitor um, said it is, regardless to having no previous convictions that that warrants six years yes. and other people were saying yeah you're going to get six years so I'd kind of got my head around okay six years it, it's done now I can't undo it um the judge was so sweet the police officers were so sweet um the judge my barrister was so sweet it was like we the judge doesn't want to send you to jail but he has to mm. so he sent me to jail for 18 months and they said they're not going to confiscate a thing they left me with everything right. um and so I've, I've gone to prison and i was locked away for six weeks in a closed mm. prison and then I was transferred to an open prison, which was like a little village. Yes. So, yes. So I spent a lot of time reflecting. And of course, that crime attracted the wrong people. And I was approached by a man who was in a London prison. Mm. And for anybody that doesn't know that when you can start off your prison sentence in, in one prison and then you get transferred to any part of the, of the, of the country. Yes. Um, and that's obviously what happened. There was people from Birmingham that had possibly been transferred to this London prison. And that's how this man found out about me. Mm. Um, we started writing to each other and then into prison phone calls. And then when I got released from prison, I started a job um, working as a contract manager I think for, I think it was a contract manager for a cleaning company mm. and then he came out of prison I came out of prison February of 1998 he came out of prison November stroke December 1998 mm. and within two weeks three weeks he had mentally broken me completely wow. completely I was not the same person um mm. I have written a book and I, I have wrote about it in the book. Um, mm. Some of the mind games that he played, um, it was, I mean, I, I look back and I said it to you earlier, it really is like a dream. I mm. really feel like the third person talking here. Sure. So <clears throat> this man was a heroin, heroin addict. I had no knowledge of heroin, none whatsoever. Um, I think my biggest drug was Benson and Hedges and Weak Lager. <laughs> <laughs> I had no knowledge. I mean, I was in my late 20s and, yeah. and most people had heard of ease and I wasn't yeah. interested. Mm. Had no interest in drugs whatsoever. Mm. Liked to be in control, liked to have my thinking faculties clear. And like I said, as I'm talking to you, I genuinely cannot believe that this happened. I just can't. I can't believe it. It's, mm. <laughs> it was bizarre. So we've I've got a six year old son and we've gone to London to meet um, my ex partner's dad um, who lived on the old Kemp Road. Mm. And while we was in the flat, um, I think we'd met his dad and then his dad went went out mm. and he left us there. My son was playing his Sonic or Nintendo, I forget what I bought him, in another room. And we was in the bedroom and he got heroin out and he put it on the foil. And I couldn't, I looked, I thought, oh my God. Because I'd seen somebody do this in prison, but I didn't mm. know what they were doing. Sure. And I thought, oh my God, oh my God, he's doing that thing. I mean, I, I, now I know it's heroin. And he's just smoking it casually as if, you know, mm. like he's just having a walk in the park. Yeah. And he said, take it. And I said, no. He said, take it. I said, no. And um, I then endured physical abuse because I wouldn't take it. But I had to I had to take that in silence because I didn't want my son because I'm my son's protector. And if, sure. if, 
if your protector's in danger, then what hope have you got? So I was mindful of my son being it, but I thought it'll pass, he'll get fed up, you know, but he wouldn't give up, he would not give up. And then he threatened to throw my son off the balcony. I think we was three mm. stories up, but it was quite high up mm. and do all sorts to my son. And I thought, right, get your act together, girl. I thought, okay, I'll take the heroin. But I, I had already planned to pretend to take it. I thought if I inhale it and don't take it, don't let it go in mm. and blow the smoke out, I'll be fine. But he he knew what I was doing. And so mm. he would he got angry again. So I reluctantly took this heroin and he was in control because it, it's, it's on foil and you need to use the lighter. Mm. And he'd run me four lines of heroin and instantly I forgive him. The feeling was like, oh, it wasn't that bad. Mm. But also I instantly hated myself. The self-hatred that I had was, it was, mm. <laughs> it's. So now my fear of heroin has gone and the, the verbal abuse is easier to take when you're taking heroin because mm. heroin just says everything's fine, everything's okay. Mm. And then I was introduced to crack cocaine, which I had no fear now, so I thought, well, what have I got to lose? Um, but before all of this, my son, we'd gone back to Birmingham and I had left my son with my parents. I didn't make any formal arrangements. It was because we, we'd lived with my parents for many years. Um, and it was only when I came out of prison that I had my own accommodation. So my yeah. son, sort of, that was his stomping ground. His, he was very familiar there. Mm. Um, and my parents, they were like, well, how has she done this? Because me and my son, we were so close. You know, it was, it, we were best friends. I mean, he, this little six-year-old, he's, first of all, he loses his mom to prison. And now she's left me for another man. Like she's dropped me and dumped me. So, but for me, it was easier that my son had those thoughts than to know that your mother is now an addict. Mm. That was- And also to know he's safe with your parents. Yes, yes. We were both selling drugs in London and we'd had six um, police raids. One of the raids, I saw it before it happened and I told him quickly, let's prepare the house, we're going to get raided. Mm -hmm. And it happened exactly as I saw it. Mm -hmm. And um, the police kept coming back and they kept coming back. And then the seventh time, um, he threw some drugs out of the window and he jumped out of the window and left me in the flat. And then I got arrested. Mm. Uh, the police later caught up with him. So we're both in prison in London on remand. I'm in Holloway, he's in Belmarsh. And um, my solicitor came to see me and said, well, it's possession with intent to supply. And you was in the flat. There was also a sawn off shotgun that he'd had. Even though the police knew that the gun didn't belong to me, and um, I, I was still aware. That's how they, they said you was aware of everything. So mm. you, you're both going down for this. So um, my solicitor said it's it's going to be three years. And I thought, no, no, I'm not. I'm not doing three years. I am not doing three years in prison. Yes, I'm guilty for taking drugs, the selling of drugs and the gun. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. It's just not happening. And as I'd made that decision, as if by magic, somebody in prison was talking about three masons and about a special handshake. And mm. that got my that got my interest. And I said, what's this? And they said, well, it's it's a it's an occult and they they work with the justice system and they don't get the time that they're supposed to get. I mean, I don't know if any of this is true, mm. but that's what I was told. And I said, OK, if they can do it, so can I. So I said, show me this handshake. And I said, oh, no, no, but it's a secret handshake. Nobody can see it. And I thought, really? <laughs> so I remember sitting in Holloway and I sat up all night with my mind. And I said, I want to see this, this sign, this handshake. Mm. And I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go to sleep. I'd lost all desire to sleep. I sat there literally all night. Mm. And I was shown something and I was like, that's not it. Is that it? I thought, oh, well, I'll try it. So um, I went to court, I don't know, two, three days later. And it was, um, I think it was Woolwich Magistrates Court. And the, the judge was, no, he was, he was so known for, for giving you, you know, oh God, yeah. He'd give you 12 months for, for throwing a, a bit of litter on the floor. He was mm. really bad. 
and I was in front of that judge and he was talking away and he was about to commit the case to Crown Court and I'd done the sign and I, I stared at him and I'd done it and he started stuttering and I was like oh my god it's working and I'd done it again and then he just he said right that's it I, I, I shouldn't do this but um give her two months get give her two months take her out of the courts this should be going he was so, like he was saying this should be going to Crown Court but I'm not sending it I just stood there and I was like oh my god it was like I was watching a film so but then when I got back to the prison I thought people are going to think that I'm an informer because that, that doesn't yeah, happen yeah it's so lenient yeah <laughs> it doesn't happen so I just kept my mouth shut and thankfully I got um transferred to uh, High Point and I got released from High Point and then because my ex-partner he got I think he got three years four years mm. I my brother contacted me I don't know how he got my number I, I, to this day I don't know how that happened mm. and he paid my my travel to come back to Birmingham and I came back to Birmingham and that is where the problem started that is where the, the substance misuse it went to another level mm. it was as if I was out to destroy myself but mm. you know David whilst I was a drug addict I could not I could not accept I'm a drug addict mm. I would look at myself in the mirror some days and say I can't accept this mm. I cannot I just can't mm. it, it's impossible um and that was in 2000 um so I'd, I'd been to prison a couple of times because I'd now become a shoplifter. Started off shoplifting from supermarkets. Um, and there are some funny stories, uh, real funny stories that, <laughs> that are, they are funny. I mean, I know, you know, I'm not laughing at the act of shoplifting, but some of the stories, I mean, even the security guards, it was, do you know, when I look back, it was as if we was doing a massive documentary or doing like a soap opera mm. and one of us got our lines wrong because many a times we would just all burst out laughing that the security guard myself yeah. the, the, and then we would get back to seriousness it was it was crazy um and in 2002 i'd gone to prison no it was the back end of 2001 i'd gone to prison i was on remand and um, it, it probably was the best thing that happened to me because like I said, I, I think I weighed something like seven stone. Mm. Um, I remember having my healthcare check when I went into the prison and the nurse looked at me and said, you don't have a pulse, young lady. You're, you're, mm. you're blinking, you're talking, but you don't have a pulse. When did you last eat? And I think I said something like three weeks ago. I don't remember, I never mm. used to eat. Water, um, all these things that we know that are important for our body. I mm. never drank water. Mm. Um, so I knew that the body was miraculous. Mm. Even just with that, knowing that I genuinely didn't take care of the body yet, I'm still, I'm still here. Mm. Um, so I'd spent um, a few months in prison and I got um, discharged from prison. And the, the, the drug addiction world, it was, it was chaotic, it was noisy. Um, some of the things that people done was so much out of my character mm. um, without um, without putting anybody down their habits were totally different to mine I, I was just a drug taker I hadn't lost my core value as, mm. as, as, a human um, being. as a human being although some of the things that I'd done the stealing of money um, the getting violent with my ex-partner I could not hurt another human being. I just couldn't do it. Mm. Um, as much as I wanted to lash out at my ex-partner for all the things he put me through, I would go weak at the thought of, of, of hurting somebody. Mm. And this definitely proved itself when there was another drug user and we just didn't like each other. I, mm. To this day, I don't know why. We just had this, this, ener this bad energy between us. And she collapsed and she died in front of me and she had her two brothers her two brothers were there I was rattling which is like detoxing mm. waiting for the heroin so yes. I'm at a really vulnerable weak state and she's died um no friend of mine and I found myself getting up kneeling down very calm mm. and pumping on her chest making a ring with my hand blowing into her lungs just very 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 um positive I knew that she wasn't going to die I knew I knew that what I was doing was going to bring her back 
And she did, she coughed and she came back and I looked at her and I thought, yep, she's okay. And I didn't say a word. I just sat down and and got on with my drugs. And Mm. then it was somebody that said, that woman saved you. And she came and said, thank you. Um, And I I didn't take any credit for it. I didn't think like you owe me because I didn't like her, David. I genuinely Mm. didn't like this woman. And this this force just took over. Yeah, it Um, just happened in the moment. Yeah, it just happened. And and I just thought, okay. Um, And everybody was silent when that happened. Nobody had an opinion about it. Nobody didn't say, well done you. Nobody said nothing. Mm. It was as if time stopped, that happened, and then time resumed. Um, and so all these things, after I'd done that for that lady, we, she said, oh, I'm going to take you out. So she, was, she, she stole credit cards um, and she took me out with her and then she ripped me off, you know, the woman. <laughs> and <Wow>. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I <just> saved your life. <laughs> <laughs> that's that that is the drugs world <laughs> but I, I, <laughs> I didn't take offense because I didn't feel like I saved her there was a deeper eye that I just didn't feel sure, I didn't yeah. feel like Amanda Amanda saved you no. and so I saw a lot I saw drug I saw drug users dying and their friends taking their trainers off their feet leaving them out I saw a lot and I just said, this world's crazy. Mm. There is no love. I've got to get out. I can't stay here. Mm. And it got that much with the the loss of both grandmothers and seeing such evil. Mm. Um, I I don't know how this happened. There's a lot of things. I think I should call myself Shaggy because I'm just saying it wasn't me and I don't know. It wasn't me and I don't (laughs) know. So I've sat there and all of a sudden, my mind has taken me to a beautiful place. And I'm like, oh, this is escapism. And I saw myself, well, I saw myself completely drug free. And I saw myself with such a loving partner Mm. and beautiful children and beautiful grandchildren and driving an amazing car and helping drug addicts. And that is all that I saw. And I thought, oh, my God, where did that come from? That was beautiful. So I kept going back there. And when I got back there, it got become more detailed and I'd become more involved with it. And the feeling and this could be right in the middle of a drugs den. And I didn't care because I had somewhere to hide. I had somewhere to escape. And I kept going there not realizing that I'm stretching my awareness had no nobody to tell me no spiritual seeking nothing and with stretching your awareness you can't unsee it Mm. but what tends to happen I know now is that you bring up the subconscious programs you bring it's like hell breaks loose and that is what happened my drug taking got a hundred times worse I had so much anger so much irritation um I saw more and more and more evil. I was, I'd missed gunshots. And and this was like going, this was like being a little child watching a TV program, a horror movie Mm. and stepping into it. That's what it was like. Mm. And the one day when I'm contemplating suicide, because now I've had enough, I can't get out of this world. There's no way. I'm saying there must be somebody. There has got to be somebody who knows who God is because I want to have a word with this God. Mm. There's got to be somebody who knows who God is amongst all these religions Mm. and there's got to be somebody who's broken free from this there has to be and I kept looking for that inspiration Mm. and I would hear of people going into rehab but I would still see the scars of drug addiction I'd say that's not it I would hear of people doing 12 steps no I want complete I was very clear that I want complete freedom I want to come out of this completely I don't want that this is not funny anymore Mm. and I had a self-reflective moment where I said I hate my life And there was like a little intuitive voice that said, is life really that bad? And I said, yes, it is. And then I sat and thought, well, I remembered when I got in trouble when I was a child and I thought the world was going to come to an end and it resolved itself. And then I imagined myself having a TV screen and a remote control and pausing my life and playing it and wanting to fix, change or improve it. Mm. But then when I'd actually played it out and I realised all the people that I'd met because of that event and and if that didn't happen this wouldn't have happened I actually sat there and said no I wouldn't change anything Mm. and I think so I made peace with with drug addiction I don't I don't quite know Mm. but this went on for many many years and in 2010 I went into prison just before my my 42nd birthday I think it was yes yes Mm. 
I was 42 in 2010. And I remember that prison sentence was a little bit different to all the others because on every prison sentence, I'd taken drugs because hmm. there was more drugs inside the prison than there was outside. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, and because it, I think it's because of the environment that you're in. It, it made it more fun to be doing something you're not supposed to be doing human nature. Mm. And, but this prison sentence, there was a drought. There was heroin, was, there was a mm. massive drought on. Mm. And I thought, well, that's good because I'm in prison. So when I get back out, the drought will be over because I've got a 12 week sentence. But I didn't attract other drug users on this sentence. I attracted women that was in prison for the first time. It, then there was non-drug related crimes. And, and I, I remember doing a lot of laughing. I remember on that prison sentence, I when I say laughed, belly laughs. Mm. And it was, just, it was just different. And there was a lady that was um, in prison. To this day, I don't know what she was doing in prison. Mm. She didn't look like your normal prisoner. No. Um, and, she I knew that she was a Christian I, she didn't tell me she didn't preach Jesus she mm. preached it in her actions mm. you could just see that this woman was she was divine and she just kept showing us love I say us there was me and maybe four or five other ladies she would bring us fruit and mm. she would bring us water because she worked in the kitchens mm. and the day that I was I was getting discharged from prison um, the stomach's churning because you, you're leaving one prison and you are going into another prison now, the prison of heroin and the prison of crack cocaine. Mm. This lady, she I was having my hair styled and some of my hair had gone onto the floor. And this lady, I saw her look at my hair and I knew what she, I knew what she was thinking because I practiced clairvoyancy mm. and it's a contact point when you, yes. when you touch somebody's hair. And she she said oh that's your hair and I said yes and there was a bit of knowing that happened in that moment so as if I knew she couldn't hurt me I just mm -hmm. knew and I knew she had no intentions of hurting me yeah. and when I was leaving um when I when I was going towards the prison gates there was quite a few women that come to wave me off because that was what they'd done in that prison people would go and wave you off and, mm -hmm. and say see you in two weeks or see you in a month <laughs> <laughs> Like a holiday camp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, I remember all the women because we'd had, they had a leaving party for me. It, it mm. was, I mean, I don't know. Prison takes away your, your freedom, doesn't it? That's what it does. But it doesn't stop you from laughing if you, no. if you can. And I saw all the women just part like the Red Sea. And this woman just walked in between them. Mm -hmm. And the lady that had, uh, that had um, been kind to me. Yes. And she was the first person to touch me. She hugged me and I heard her and I thought, hold on, I've heard that language before. Mm -hmm. And she was praying in tongues. And I said, she's praying in tongues. I don't know how I knew that because I, I, like I say, mm -hmm. I didn't follow any, any religion. I didn't do any religious practices, but I knew. And then it reminded me of my dream. I said, that's the language in my dream. Mm -hmm. I just knew. And she looked at me and, and, she, she said her goodbyes and then the other ladies come and hugged and we cried and, you know, be careful, be safe and don't do anything. I wouldn't do all of that, that jargon. And then I got on the train and normally my palms would be sweating and my stomach mm. would be churning and nothing happened. And I'm like, I'm a little bit confused now. Where's, where's the, the pull for heroin? Mm. But because... For me, as an addict, it's it's losing control. You 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 hand over your authority to dust, to powder. Yeah. Yes. And to me, that was the annoying thing that I've I'm willingly giving my control to something. Mm. And because the control was no longer there, I said, I am going to take control of this because I I'd never heard of that happening to anybody. Yes. Because even though I was in prison for 12 weeks and there was a drought, I was still detoxing. I was still going through the stomach cramps yes. um, and the, the heroin nightmares and the thinkingness around heroin and crap. It was still very present. It's just that it wasn't physically there. So it, I yes. was still in that addictive, that addictive yeah, mind was still there. Around. Yes. So I'd made a decision that I've got my money, my discharge grants. I'm going to buy the heroin. I'm now going to control you. 
And that's exactly what I did. And because, like I said, I had no heroin for 12 weeks, it was very potent. Mm. And as was the crack cocaine. And I thought, for good measure, I'm going to use, I'm going to drink a bottle of Irish cream. And I did that. And I, I met with a friend and we smoked the drugs all night. What I didn't mention, and I should have mentioned earlier, was on this particular prison sentence, I was called to the resettlement unit. And that's the first time that had ever happened to me. And that was because I was homeless. I was homeless mm. for, for years. Mm. And they'd called me to the resettlement unit and said that we, where would you like to live? And out of my mouth came Erdington, which is an area in Birmingham. Birmingham. I don't know what made me say it. I mm. had no connections there. Mm. And I even thought to myself, why did I say Erdington? Mm. But I didn't feel to correct it. And as soon as I said Erdington, they moved so quickly, the staff, and they said, we found you a supported accommodation. And this is the address, take this with you. So I've got this address, but when I come out of prison, I wanted to, to control the drugs. So I took drugs at my friend's address. Now, I say friend, he was my driver. I used to pay him a hundred pounds a day for taking me shoplifting. So he was happy to see me. Um, and his, his accommodation was immaculate. It wasn't like a drug den. He no. he'd lived a relatively normal sort of normal life but he he was a he, he he'd taken drugs but it hadn't controlled him as much as it had controlled me and others sure. so his his home was safe it was clean but something the next morning something was telling me I've got to get away from I've just got to get away and I when I woke up um I could hear voices and it was my friend was talking with somebody and I heard him say yes, make sure you give her some heroin because she's a good shoplifter and she will repay you. And I heard him. But I, that, that, that's, what, that's what happens with drugs. There's, you know, everybody is after everybody. Nobody's straight. <laughs> so I'd gone to the bathroom and, and I just pretended that I hadn't heard it. And mm. um, my friend introduced me to his friend and he offered me some heroin. I wanted to say yes, but no came out of my mouth. And then mm. I felt physical force turn me and marched me back to pick my handbag up. And I mm. said, no, no, this is spooky. I've got to go. So my friend dropped me um, to the accommodation in Erdington. Mm. And when I walked in, um, the lady who owns the, the supported accommodation, I felt immediate resistance, but she was, she was very non-judgmental, very light. Mm. And the first thing I said to her was, I can see through you. And she went, oh, that's interesting, dear, because I can see through people too. And it just threw me because yeah. she was so sweet the way she said it. Mm. And she showed me to my room and I walked into my room and I, I just had this thought that I won't do drugs in here again. I mean, I won't do drugs in this room. I, I just won't. Not mm. ever again, but just in this room. Yes. And so I unpacked all my stuff and um, got to meet the other residents, done a bit of shopping, come back, went to bed that night, woke up the next morning and I was in Christ consciousness. It had gone, the whole thing. All the addiction had gone? Gone, everything. And um, when I explain this story to people, they say that I can see that they're baffled. They're trying to work it out with the mind. I wasn't there, the, my psychological yes. mind, my conscious mind, it wasn't there, nothing was there, yeah. nothing was there. And how I explain it, I had to explain it for me to get it before I could explain it to anybody else was the, the addict that was trapped in this yeah. body with, with, with mental health, with uh, manipulation, with lying, with stealing, everything, everything, yes. the whole thing of drug addiction. When this body went to sleep, that left the body. It died. It yes. came out of the body. And a new being went in and took over mm. this body. Mm. That is the absolute best way that I can explain it because yes. I can't find an explanation. Yes. Um, but I everything was okay. I didn't, I didn't wake up and say, oh, my God, I'm free of drugs. There was no drugs. Mm. This new being didn't know anything about drugs, mm. didn't know anything, didn't know anything about anything. Mm. It was just pure acceptance. And the lady that owned the supported accommodation, she was a student of Bob Proctor. She'd become um, mm. a life success oh, yes. consultant because he was called Life Success um, 2007, 2008. Mm. And she sat me down and she showed me the stick person presentation. Mm. 
And she'd also listened to somebody called Robert Scheinfield, who I've not really heard of much, but mm -hmm. he does something called the power and the presence of God. And he talks about the, the playing field and us being the sun and we are projecting the human body. And mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a story. And she was showing me all of this and it was resonating. It, it didn't make sense, but it was just resonating. It was, it, yeah. it, it just, it just was. Um, the shoplifting continued, but I wasn't involved in it. I watched the body and I didn't have a judgment. I didn't have the desire to stop it. I just didn't know. Mm -hmm. And it, it carried on. It just felt, I don't know, there was no stickiness to it. Mm -hmm. And it didn't even feel like a crime was being committed. It was really strange mm -hmm. or literally all judgment. And then a few days later, I'd gone out shoplifting and I said, why am I shoplifting? And by now I've been introduced to Jesus. I was a little bit hostile at first. I was like, don't tell me about your Jesus, please. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know anything. Um, and I'd managed to go to church and, and I'd heard um, the, the vicar was talking about Jesus and that um, you can talk to God and God hears you. And that was all that I wanted to hear. I thought I'm going to meet this God. I've been looking to, to tell him what I want to tell him. Mm. And I came home and I offloaded, I poured out my heart. I said all the things that I'd done wrong, everything. I'd literally talked myself to sleep. But when I woke up the next day, my God, did I feel, oh, I feel amazing. I feel free. And so I'd, I'd got this relationship now that I can actually talk to God I didn't know where he was, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, he, it wasn't a concept of he's out there and it kind of was and it wasn't, it, I, I don't know, I just knew that I was heard and I prayed, I said, um, please tell me how to, you've taken this drug addiction away, I don't know how you've done it, but I know it's you, I know it wasn't a man, even though that lady put her hands on me, she didn't hear my cry. She didn't no. hear of, she didn't hear of the pain that I went through. Um, and I said, I know it's you. I know you're behind it. And I know that if you've done that, then surely you can stop me from stealing and lying. And that was it. And I, and then as soon as I said that prayer, I had a letter from one of the women in prison saying, you know, you promised to get me this, that and the other, could you get it? And I said, Oh my God, that prayer, I cancel that prayer because I've got to go and get this lady some clothes because she had no money coming in. Yes. So, I, so I went, <laughs> I had a shower because in prison you have money sent to you in prison and she wasn't having that. So I had a shower and I picked up my shoplifting bags and I went to go out of the door to shoplift and my heart wouldn't let me. And I said, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Prayers don't get answered that quickly. No, no, no. Now I'm trembling now, there's the fear of God. And I sat down and I closed my eyes and I clasped my hands and I said, oh my God, oh my God, what am I going to do for money? Oh my God, oh my God. I said, I'm not asking you for money, but I'm, what am I going to do? So I'm justifying myself. Oh my God, oh my God. And then all of a sudden my door flew open and the lady that owned the sporty accommodation had some money in her hands and she mm -hmm. handed it to me. She said, Jesus said to give you that. And she walked out. It was like she was in a trance. Wow. And I took the money and I'm looking for CCTV. And then I realized CCTV can't see what's happening within. And that was the beginning of my faith walk. Mm. I said, so Jesus, you're my provider. Okay, that solves it. So anything I wanted, I asked Jesus for. And um, the next thing on my agenda was now that drugs have gone and now that everything, a husband, have I got a husband? And I felt him say, yes. I was like, fantastic, that's it. And I dropped it. Um, and as I'm going through, um, the lady that owned the supported accommodation, she was a Christian. Mm. She'd also done a lot of personal development. She'd, she'd studied Lester Levingston, his life, and she'd studied the Sedona method. She, she was quite loaded mm. with information. And she said to me, she said, Amanda, God told me to tell you that you was married to the devil. And <laughs> <laughs> I said okay and I could see the devastation in her face but I knew mm. what she meant I knew because sure. 
you know, you, you, you're doing drugs, you're practicing mm. clairvoyancy. You, there's loads of things that could say, well, yeah. the devil is negativity, isn't it? You're married to negativity. So that day, um, on the evening, my whole body started to itch. Mm. And I, I was given some cream from the doctor and some shower gel. And, and literally from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet was on fire, itching. Mm. Real, I was ripping my skin apart. And I jumped mm. up from the communal living area ran to my room, stripped off, grabbed my oil item, grabbed my dressing gown. And as soon as that happened, the itching stopped instantly. It just stopped. And I found myself plonked on the bed and I said, Lord, how do I divorce the devil? And I'm waiting for the voice of God. <laughs> and I, what I heard next, I didn't want to accept because it was very clear. Hmm. The voice of intuition said, you know what you have to do. And I opened my eyes and I saw all my shoplifting worldly goods. And there was thousands of pounds, David, thousands, mm. um, everything. The, because I'm no longer taking drugs, the accumulation of things, because I've become a professional shoplifter. Yeah. I could take a thousand pounds worth of clothes out of a shop in a few minutes mm. and pay my driver a hundred and still earn 400. I was very fast at it because I, I would see it first. Mm. I would see, I would see the security guard not seeing me, everything. And I didn't realize that that is how I was working. That's yes, how I, I was, yeah, it was, it was, it was my norm. And so I'd looked at all of my goods. I'd looked at, I'm just starting to enjoy life again. This mm. is not fair. And then I wanted to say no. And then I said, you know what? Yes. And as I said, yes, I felt the release of freedom mm. and I packed everything up bit by bit and I was having a wonderful time doing it I was like even clothes that had labels on yes you're going in the bag and it was that freedom until I was left with one outfit one set of underwear one pair of trainers one pair of pajamas mm -hmm. that were not stolen even my toothbrush was stolen my contact lenses were bought with stolen money I threw everything away my glasses and um I threw them on the streets I went back to my room and for the first time I was in in clear seeing I was it was serenity it was pure surrender I was so vulnerable but it just felt nothing and no one can ever ever harm me I I, I knew that anyway but that was the that was like the confirmation. Um, within two weeks I'd not only had people come from all over to bring me gifts Mm -hmm. um I had to hold my hands up to heaven I, I'd given lots of it away as well yes and, and I inspired a lot of people a lot of Christians started throwing their clothes away and it was amazing <laughs> <laughs> and so I've got this really strong relationship with Jesus and mm -hmm. um and then one day in September I'm I I've just woken up and I've got no makeup on and my hair's a mess and dressing gown on and in fact I think I was going because I was still in the supported accommodation I think I was going to the bathroom mm -hmm. and the doorbell rang and I opened the door and there was two police officers mm -hmm. and one of them just said hello and walked straight past me and I thought how rude mm -hmm. and his colleague you could see was a bit embarrassed and was tittering mm -hmm. away and I stood there and he'd, he'd come to check on a service user that had a safeguarding issue yeah. And so he was in and he was out. And that was the end of it. I thought nothing of it. I went and, and went to use the bathroom and so forth. And then the following year, on Friday the 13th, mm -hmm. January, Friday the 13th, there was a knock at the door and it was that police officer again, but he'd come with two colleagues and they came in and they was just talking to all of us at the supported accommodation. Mm -hmm. And um, they was there for a couple of hours and then they, then they got an emergency call. And as they were going, the one police officer, he gave me his number. He said, call me. And I was like, oh, my God. And I opened it and it had his name on there. So it wasn't like PC, mm -hmm. whatever. It was his actual name. And I thought, could this be? I asked God for a husband. Could, no, surely to God, no. So <laughs> that was... <laughs> <laughs> that was Friday. That was Friday the thirteenth. So Saturday and Sunday, I thought I'm going to go to church first. I'm going to pray about this, and um, I just found myself calling him on the Sunday, and he sounded lovely. And 
that was the beginning of, of a 10 year, well, it's, yeah, it's 10 years, 10 years, it's 2022 now, 10 years that we've been we've together. Been together. Yeah. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> Someone has a real sense of humour. <laughs> David, I don't take anything seriously. No, I that's... that's... I don't take anything seriously. <laughs> And the fact that he worked for Drug Squad, you know, and, and, <laughs> and he, I don't know, it, it, it was, I think the whole world was against us. But because mm. Jesus said to me, yes, mm. I held on to his yes. I said, listen, sure. if, if Jesus said yes, then it's yes, that's it. Mm. And it was like, oh, no, he must be a married man. Oh, no, he all these, all these, these different stuff. And I said, well, you know, I just, I just trust Jesus. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not fighting it. Mm. If he comes, if he's not the one, he will go. Mm. It, it's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, and so from 2011, um, I've had a miraculous walk. Um, mm. I remember the, when I was, when I went into my fantasy world as a drug, as a drug user, when I saw myself driving a beautiful car, my mentor phoned me one day and said I've got you a car and I was like oh okay and it was a Peugeot and it was a lovely little Peugeot and I loved it and I looked after this Peugeot every Saturday I was there with the, the, the bucket and I would clean it I then become a Zumba fitness instructor um, and so I had a lot of attention from the Department for Work and Pensions they've done a case study on me and used mm -hmm. me as an example of somebody that was broken that is now setting up their own business oh, wow. and and so it got quite exciting. I connected with friends on Facebook, school friends, because I, I didn't touch social media. Yeah. And I'm now dating a really lovely guy. And so my life is, it's, 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 it's fantastic. Mm. And I now wanted to move on. I want to move on from the supported accommodation. I've been here for a year, coming on two years, mm. and I want my own accommodation. And I know how to use the mind. So I'm mm. visualizing a beautiful home, but nothing's happening. I'm stuck mm. so I kind of screamed at the universe like, I'm frustrated this is not fair come on I want my, I want my own home so that day that I screamed at the universe I'm I've parked my car um at Eddington High Street mm -hmm. and I've gone to I've, I've gone somewhere one of the shops on my way back all of a sudden, I feel a big thump in my back and I fell over. I fell on this woman. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know what happened. And I looked around and I saw a massive lorry. You know those lorries that you see on the motorway? Oh, yeah. The lorry, yeah. it had mounted the curb and it hit me and I fell on this woman. But I, oh, wow. but I didn't feel anything, Dave. It felt like, a, I don't know. Never. <laughs> <laughs> so I I didn't know what happened. And thankfully, the 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 owner well the, the car park manager was he was he'd seen everything mm. and the lady had fallen on she'd broken her wrist and she managed to jump up and take the registration number and call the driver and tell him to stop um and so i i genuinely i didn't have any pain um mm. i did go to the hospital because i thought maybe i'm in shock i don't know um but i certainly didn't put a claim in mm. um but then the next day a claim company phoned me and said you've been in a car accident and I was like, how do you know? Mm. Unless it was, I know that people can do that, that you can get, I get them now, those mm -hmm. calls, and I just ignore them. And yeah. I was like, yes, I was in a car accident. And I got my my compensation. Um, and that was what I used for a deposit for my my flat. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, I had a studio. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this story, it can it go on. works in mysterious ways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, grace become really overwhelming because I still don't know who Jesus is I'm talking to this Jesus and I don't know who he is and I don't know who I am mm. and I screamed at God I said if you're not going to tell me who I am and who you are then I, I don't want to be here any longer because mm. it's too painful mm. you are a beautiful God but I know that you're not outside of me but I can't find you inside of me either mm. and my mentor spontaneously sent me Muji Mm. I'd never heard nothing about spiritual awakening, nothing. It was pure Christianity. It mm. was praying, praying in tongues, going to church, singing worship songs, reading the Bible, talking to God, but nothing about, you know, this infinite nature, who am I? And I listened to Muji and I didn't quite grasp it, but I kind of knew that I'd opened a tin of worms. I thought, mm. what have I done? 
I can't unhear this. Mm. And um, it wasn't very long after that, that my mind got really, it's really started to mess. All my belief system started crumbling. Mm. And so I said, you know what, because I was used to God just providing, I didn't have to sweat. I, I was used to it. I was comfortable to walk away from my day job. And I sat down for four weeks. I just locked myself away. I was still doing Zumba classes, which was good. I would go out, do a Zumba 45 minute session, come back home, shower, pajamas, sit down and listen. I just constantly listened to Muji, mm. constantly done self investigation. And the, the mind was, oh my God, oh, I, it was like a dark night of the soul. Mm. It was, and it, it's as if God said, okay, that's enough, that's enough, go back to work. Somebody mm. approached me and said, we need a support worker, you fit the bill. So I went back to work and because I worked with mental health and with people with challenging behaviours, I would remember Muji's words and I would say, who's suffering? And so the mind would go quiet. I would always say, when a challenge come, I'd stop. And I'd say it in front of the person, David, mm. I didn't care. I'd say, am I suffering? And everybody would go quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd say no I'd say right carry on what's your problem and they'd say it's okay it's okay. <laughs> so I started on Muji and then I got to hear about Eckhart Tolle and I bought the power of now um mm -hmm. no I didn't I bought the new earth sorry I'd read yes. the power of now I got it from a library I got the new earth yes and then so it was mainly Muji and Eckhart I'd heard a bit of Rupert Spira mm -hmm. but I couldn't I couldn't take Rupert in at first hmm. but I could take in the yoga meditation yes. and then it, it was where um, I realized that you don't hear with your ears you hear with your being yes. and I, I, every morning I would do yoga meditation and feel um, and every morning every time I'd done it an airplane would go over my house and I would just feel it go through my being it's wow. as if I yeah. don't know and it, it wasn't a set time every no. time and it would just come and I'd hear the birds singing and I'd I think everything's in the same space. So I experienced a lot of that, a lot of yes. separating, looking at the, the mind. and and But then my mind became extremely potent. I mm -hmm. would think something and instantly it would show up good or bad. Mm. Wow. And I got it. I, I, I went into a course of miracles and my mentor pulled it away from me. She went, no, don't touch it. Your mind is too potent. Leave mm. that alone because yes. I would. I manifested a bumblebee in my kitchen with no windows open in the middle of December. Mm. And it just, it was massive. It was like a bird. Mm. And then I, it was just crazy things I was manifesting. Mm. And um, I sort of settled with it. I think I settled with it when I come across Lester Levenston because I could relate. Where Lester had had an illness, his back against the wall, I could relate mm. to mine was a probably a self-inflicted illness but my back was against the wall mm. and that is where I met infinite intelligence so when I'm listening to to spiritual teachers and listening to people talking about awakening and and all the different words that we use it was resonating and I, I understood mm. it but I I had so much information I didn't know what to do with it I needed to get it organized because yes. the mind the mind had a lot to say about me waking up. Yeah. It had so much mm. to say. Mm. Um, and so over the over the course of years from 2016, um, I I did buy the greatest secrets. Um, mm. I also did um, one of Bob Proctor's courses, um, a six-month course, mm -hmm. and that it was like a sponge. I was taking it in, thinking, mm. I think, thinking into results program. I'd done that. But the greatest secret in reading that when I don't know who said it, but it says the body doesn't know you. I was like stunned. Mm -hmm. I was stunned for like 10 minutes. I couldn't move, David. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like doesn't know me. And I had I had a couple of moments in the book and because I've also I've got it on my Kindle, but I've also got the audio mm. where I would hear something and I'd be like, yeah, that's true. Um, and there was a moment when I dropped the imagination and I was like, it's mm. so clear. But yeah. then I'd fall back. I would fall back again. And then I heard yeah. you, David. Mm -hmm. um, I heard you on Conscious TV and you done effortless realisation. Mm. And that was it. The final scale fell away. Fantastic. So, mm, yeah. Such an amazing story.
all or nothing. You either give me freedom or I stay on drugs. I don't want no. to be um, telling myself I'm free for one day when I'm not. No, yeah. either I stay there or I come off. Yeah. There's, no, there's no middle ground. Well, there's the, the mental body, which is where all the turbulence is. And then there's effortless being. And for you, really, the all of the activity within the dualistic mind that just kind of fell away and then you were left with your infinite nature and that um well actually Eckhart Tolle had a similar thing his was to do with depression but the whole preoccupation it's where the mind the mind just comes to an end and then what you're left with is your infinite nature and that's uh yeah it's been it's been such a story for you that's an incredible ride what I really like is the way people who've had, you know, very extreme experiences, including crime, it just blows apart all of the conventional views of things like, you know, worthiness and deserving. Yes. It, it just yes. makes everyone realise yes. we, we, we actually all remain as the pristine, infinite being. We're mm. just having these little rights. Mm. And it's um, mm -hmm. it, it, even as you well, when we were speaking earlier and you were saying about the about the conversations you were having you know when there was the security guard and you know the shoplifting and that it was almost like a little play and you were playing these serious roles and then yes. it, it's like it is with actors sometimes it just sort of breaks down and they're just it's just like a really hilarious situation mm. i've experienced that a couple of times i remember when i was um parking my car um and, and you have to come off an island little mini roundabout and there was yes. only two parking spaces yeah. um and i'd indicated and i'd called in and then this taxi driver started bipping his horn and pointing for me to go forward but he didn't know there was a drop curb there it looked like there was another parking space yeah. so i'm thinking right i'm gonna show him how dare he and he's there bipping his horn and wagging his finger and I can't get my seat out of quick enough and we both got out of the car and we just both burst out laughing at each other <laughs> we just burst out laughing yeah. and I was like it's like it was just we didn't say anything it I think we both, yeah. yeah it just collapsed <laughs> and I thought oh my god this is amazing this is yeah. amazing but yes I, I'm glad that you touched on 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 that because of tell me about the imagination and I, I thought well I don't know how to and people were calling me from all over the world I countries mm. I hadn't even heard of wow. um via Facebook messenger and there was one yes. lady in Canada, and I don't know I just felt I've got to reach out to this woman mm. and she become a really good friend she also become a client because mm -hmm. I took her through um it, it, it was a tailored course around her and and her challenges did fall away yes. and that was one of the things that she was stuck on she said, I'm not deserving and when I told her my story again and I went a little bit deeper mm. and I said you know um I didn't I didn't rob anybody when I done shoplifting I justified that and I would steal from shops that had insurance and the big supermarkets but it doesn't make it right however what's the difference of me doing that and sitting down with somebody who's just robbed an old lady i'm in mm -hmm. partnership with them i'm sat with them i'm smoking drugs with them so i'm as guilty as they are i said and even after that god's mercy was mm -hmm. still available to me mm -hmm. i said so this deserving we can't do anything to deserve it we cannot mm -hmm. and no. and then i to explain the story i said right let's just say that we are you can be you and i can be me and we've got no problems there are no problems at all we are infinite intelligence and we decide to go into a playground and we go into a playground you decide to go on the roller coaster i decide to go on the waltzers and i come back and i start telling you all about the waltzers and yeah. what it done to me and you're telling me about the roller coaster. i said have we changed we're mm. talking about experiences yes that loving being that entered that playground is the same loving being that comes out of that playground yeah. with the, the experience yes. and she got it then that's how because yes. i think because i've been through so much i find it very easy and it intuitively i know what a person wants to hear i know where somebody yes. is yeah. and i know what story to give them and they say we've got it yes. so 10 years of me sweating and pulling my hair out somebody can get it in two seconds it's amazing isn't it yeah you've had to tread the path first really but the, yeah. the way you described it and for you know for, for there to be realization is is the final liberation really because 
lots of things, as, as you say, like the 12 step program and different things, they're still in relation to the individual, but the final liberation is when we realize that we're the, the infinite impersonal being, which we've always remained as. Yeah. And then uh, you, you realize that all of the drama related just to the character, it didn't actually mm. relate to you. Mm. Yeah. I mean, people see me and they say, you know, um, nobody, it, it's like, I don't know, I can't explain it. The, the wanting of approval I've never really well drug addiction took that away any approval that I wanted drug addiction drug addiction dealt with mm. wanting to feel secure wanting yeah. approval. it's very um, liberating in some ways isn't it because all of the conventional things that keep people yeah. in a very limited space they just have to go so lo 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 lots of people who have been involved in various forms of addiction are the most they're very broad, really, in their yeah. ability to be forgiving and to be open and, and just to be accepting and, and not, yes. not to be having to def defend their ego either. You know, it's yes. just, all of yeah. that's gone, really. Yes, it, it, it's as if it, it because I did used to um, have a judgment towards people that took drugs because I knew nothing about it. And it's mm. as if it's as if um, Gray said, OK, let mm. me take you through it. Let, yeah. let, go through it and I'm so I would never I wouldn't change I wouldn't change any of it none no. of it none none well, quite often you know when you have a conversation with someone who's been involved in addiction whether it's drugs or alcohol uh, you, you find that quite often they're the most sensitive people the reason they were involved in the first place is that they f found life so challenging that it you know mm -hmm. they, they couldn't get through it because they were hypersensitive mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yes yes but um the awakening, well, I say awakening, I call it awakening because I see myself as I was asleep mm. um, because the imagination, mm. the magic, when we were imagining, well, like hypnotized, so that's the sleeping yes. state, and then yes. that falls, it drops away, and you're just left as awareness, conscious, yes. aware, mm. um, and then the real work begins. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah the, it'll be really interesting to see the way uh infinite consciousness uses you though really because you've had such a, a wide-ranging <laughs> experience <laughs> but it's um that's the nice thing because it, it is very much to do with the sort of example if, if you exemplify the ability to you know cease addiction and there for the uh, for there to be realization then that gives permission to everyone else they, they yes. all say, oh, yeah that's for me as well then yeah 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 um yes there is some um i think i've possibly helped i don't know how many i've helped actually i've done some one-to-one -one work with some addicts and they've heard my story and that was enough for them yes. um there was one lady that was in america who called me um and I think that, I think, is it a five, five hour uh, gap time-wise? I think five or six hours. Mm. So it was 9 a.m. Um, British summertime. So it would have been sort of three o'clock in the morning. And I kind of knew, yes. I thought, well, that is the kind of time that drug addicts tend to be awake, whether yes. it's using substances or, you know, not being able to sleep. Yes. And she called me and... There was no space she was just telling me about the problem and what this mm. person had done and that person had done and at that point in my say journey but don't really but in yes kind of journey i'd separated myself and i was just hearing this voice there was mm. and judgment was coming up yeah. and i would just not i wouldn't own that judgment i wasn't i wasn't trying to to quiet it, I just wouldn't own it. And the judgment was in the same space as her voice and everything's going on. Mm. And then when she'd got a lot off her chest, I just told her, I think, I don't remember what I said to her, but I, I got her mind quiet in a second. Mm. And I said, where's your drug addiction? Mm. She said, it's gone. It's not, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, stay that, stay aware, mm. keep that awareness. And she said, how did you do that? I said, I didn't. I didn't do anything. You done it. Mm. You, I just pointed you back to what is always there. Yeah. Um, and she writes to me. Um, well, she messages me 
And she says, that quiet place, I can find it now on my own. I can find it now. Because I think she then went off and started listening to Eckhart Tolle. She'd heard of Eckhart Tolle. Yes. But really. And so it, it is amazing um, mm. because I heard one of your um, videos. I don't remember who you was talking to. Um, I think it was one of yours. And, and it was this concept of the, the subconscious mind because I was certainly... I'd heard teachings around the subconscious mind can take years and years and years mm. to get rid of. Yes. Yes and no, because the subconscious mind is as powerful as we, it, because the, everything comes from us, the power comes from yes. us, it's powerful as we make it. Yeah, if yeah, I yeah. say it's going to take years, then it's going to take, because yeah. I make the decision. <laughs> yeah, you call the shots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, when I come to that realization, I said, "Right, today you go. Today, yeah. today you go. You're yeah. often that's enough. Pack your bags. You're going today." That's brilliant. Yeah, that's a yeah. It's a real shortcut, then, isn't it? Because yes, all of the concepts we'd held about it being a long time, and and that we're actually carrying any of this stuff because none of it actually belongs to us. We remain pristine, you know, and and so it's it's actually really easy, mm. and. Uh, but but it's just that there's so much stuff around, you know, guilt and ownership yeah. of these limitations yeah. and the idea of processing them. But actually, we don't need to because they weren't ours in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Because I did hear a teaching, David. I don't remember. I think it might have been Adashanti or, or was it Alan Watts? Mm. I don't remember who it was. My memory is not very good, is it? Because I don't hold on to things. I hear things and it, it's the sound. And then, OK, and then it's gone. But, but I, but I remember hearing um, there's something was said about um, I forgot what I was going to say now. Um, it was about the psychological mind. Mm. Um, 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 it was OK. It, somebody was saying it, it's not useful or it may not be useful to tell people that it's only a dream. It's yes. only an illusion, which is true because the mind is going to hear that and the mind is then going to try and work out a dream. And the mind can't because the mind no. is in the dream. Yes. And that is kind of, I think, I think that's where my, because I do, I kind of stand back and I don't know, I can jump. I say I can jump. I, I've got this story going on where I can see the past. Yeah. I can just see yes. it in one dot. I can see. Yeah. Um, because February this year, I don't know if I mentioned it on here or if I mentioned it in our talk, I, I was ripped through the Bible. I saw Moses, I saw Elijah, I, and I saw the end. I saw the new heaven, the new earth. And I was like, oh, my God, is that? But I, it was crazy. It was, yes. I, I think the mind just went in, the mind went absolutely, it went crazy. The mind knew it was losing its power. Yes. Um, and... Um, that's when I went into, I had like the a blueprint of leadership downloaded that I, I've tested and I've actually seen the results very, very quickly yes. where yes. when you're leading yourself, everything, and I mean everything lines up, yes. Um, yes. You, you, you start to see the innocence of people. If you couldn't see it before, I, I, hmm. I was quite angry once. Well, not angry, I was a little bit annoyed at this man because I thought he'd jump the queue and it was it was hot and sticky in the shop I was like how dare you and then I just looked and I thought no he's innocent and then I thought and that person is and that and I just saw pure innocence and it was mm. nobody's to blame nobody does anything mm -hmm. so I kept getting little snippets and little snippets yeah. and and I since I since I'd done that or I don't know I didn't do anything but since that happened um with sorting out the well-being hierarchy which is really health is at the top um it's kind of like I've, what i've kind of done is given the body a command that this is this is how i don't know maybe that might sound a bit too regimental but i've sort of sorted the body out so i can leave the body to go and do its thing yes. it will automatically go and and look after yeah. itself so that it's like the koshas really the the different uh, there are the different filters the, okay. the, the physical the emotional the mental the body of wisdom and body of bliss and and mm -hmm. we we can utilize all of those and it sounds yes. as though some of that's come through in terms of being able to consciously use them yes yes so the body does take care of itself um mm. it sort of does but it doesn't like it, it will be it, it will the body will remember 
two liters of water the body will remember exercise yes. without me i will just be there do i say okay okay yes it's time to go and and it's just like it's like that is just working and i yeah. am witnessing and enjoying and being a part of yes. and being away from and yes. it's all, all everything but everything at the end of it there's this this peace yeah. sometimes last night I think when I thought about meeting with you today the joy came up and it was quite uncomfortable it was a lot of joy and I had to say come on up you come back <laughs> I couldn't sit I was like oh my god come on I'm gonna have to go for a walk to get rid of this joy <laughs> and then it just transcended into peace and it, it's yeah. still been yeah, yeah it's still there fantastic mm. well Amanda it's been amazing really to have a conversation <laughs> with you it's been a wild ride this one <laughs> But uh, yeah, much appreciation. It's yeah, it, it's it's just amazing the way the the the, the options for realization are coming forward for people to see. Because it, it's like you were saying earlier, the way if you demonstrate something, then people can just accept that they can incorporate that into their own experience, and that's really right. what you've done so effectively. Because on the periphery of you know human experience, you know people sometimes dismiss it, but actually everything can be integrated into realization and that's oh, what you've done from the, you, you've integrated the polarities and they've been pretty wide in your experience <laughs> <laughs> yes i have yes but so thanks, thanks so much amanda that's absolutely brilliant thank you thank you david